is where we'll be tonight, the fifth chapter of Galatians. Ladies and gentlemen, we've made it to the middle of the week. It only goes downhill from here. And we'll be to the weekend where you and I can get rest. So that way we can do it all again next week. So just be encouraged in that. Uh, tonight, I do not anticipate I do not anticipate in taking long. Uh, tonight we will be starting a three-part series that I felt the Lord has laid on my heart to share. It's nothing you guys haven't heard before. It's just a beautiful reminder, at least to myself, of what you and I should do as Christians. Galatians chapter 5, the fifth chapter of Galatians. And I want to start off by asking you, are you under the influence? Are you under the influence, and for my particular life, I think that answer would be yes. Now, before you go ahead and start accusing me of an alcoholic and how I shouldn't be up here, I would like to just say that I think you and I are under the influence of things throughout the day, throughout our lives all the time. We're always under a sense of influence. There is someone who always influences us, or maybe something or a particular uh, type of reason why you and I do things. Just talk about work, for example. Uh, I do the things that I do at my job because it's in my job description and I'm supposed to do it. That's a good influence. That's one of the reasons why I do it. Another reason why I do it is for my boss or the person that I answer to. If it gets to a point where those responsibilities are not met throughout the time I'm at work, my boss is going to feel the necessity to let me go. And then I would no longer be influenced by my boss because I would not be employed under him. I would not be working for him any longer. So he's the reason why I do the things at my job that I need to do to make sure that he can answer to his boss and his boss can answer to his boss and that at the end of the day, at the end of the, the, um, the work day, everything goes smoothly. How about at home? Uh, maybe your children influence you. Now, not in the essence of they tell you what to do, but you want to be a good parent for your child. You want to be a good mother, a good father, so you do the things that a mother or the father is supposed to do. And so I would say that you and I are influenced a lot in our lives. And not only are we influenced by things, but we also influence things. Uh, we always also have an influence maybe to a particular person, or maybe even to an inanimate object. I remember when my dad and I, when I was younger, I was about 12, my dad decided to try to teach me how to drive. Now, I didn't go on the roads. We lived in a little neighborhood. The neighborhood had a cul-de-sac. And so we, he got me in the car and said, all right, son, you're going to get your permit in about two years, but I want to give you kind of the flow of how a car goes. So I was sitting in the driver's seat, and I'd be so excited. I saw all my friends who were 14 and 15 uh, learning how to drive, so I wanted to do the same thing. So I was really excited so I could go to school and tell my friends, yeah, I know how to drive. I'm pretty cool. And so I would get behind the wheel, and my dad said, all right, this is the steering wheel. This is how you go left. This is how you go right. These are your gears. Park, reverse, neutral, drive, and low. You have the uh, brake on the left side, the gas on the right side. You don't slam on the gas, you slowly accelerate, you gradually accelerate, and then you gradually touch the brakes. And when I started doing it, it was kind of pretty good. So like I said, we had a cul-de-sac, and I was getting to the end of the cul-de-sac, and you know, usually you have to go on a big round circle to go back the other way. And as I was doing that, see, I got the, the gas and the acceleration down, but the turning wasn't my strong point to start off. I completely misjudged my turn, and I actually clipped a mailbox the very first time I got behind the wheel. <clears throat> now, lucky for me, and lucky for my dad's bank account, it was, um, it was I, I hit the mailbox with my um, side mirrors, and the side mirrors folded in. And so, the, the, the mailbox got very little damage, if any at all, just the mirror got scratched up, and my dad could live with that, he didn't want to replace a whole mailbox. So, he was like, son, you gotta watch your turns, you gotta watch it again. Well, I go around and I'm doing this, I'm cruising, I feel like I'm looking pretty good. I'm coming back at the same cul-de-sac, and actually, according to my dad, I don't know if this is true, true or not, but the radius got worse, and it looked like I was going to actually hit the mailbox head on. So my dad took the wheel, and he had to yank it out of my hand from the passenger seat and yank it to where we could miss the mailbox. And so, 
I guess you could say I was pretty much training to be a South Florida driver at the time, in Georgia, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, my dad yanked it right out of my hand and I missed the mailbox entirely. Now, what was the influence with the car moving? It, 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 was it the fact that my dad jumped in the driver's seat and took control? Not necessary. The driver technically was still me. The mind didn't get a car, or a, excuse me, the car didn't get a mind of itself and just get out the way. But my dad was able to influence the car by taking the wheel and shifting it the other way to making sure that the, for the second time I went around that cul-de-sac, I actually didn't touch that mailbox. And a lot of times, Christian, you and I have to recognize that God is driving or God is in control of our lives. And with that, we should allow God to be in control of our lives and let him influence our directions or influence what we do in our life. So... I want to preach just uh, for the next three weeks out of a particular section in Galatians chapter 5 and a title or a message I have entitled Under the Influence and this would be part number one. Galatians 5 verse number 16, the Bible starts off by saying, This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, or excuse me, the flesh, for the flesh lusteth not against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led on the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I, <clears throat> excuse me, as I have also told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things there is no law. Now, Father, I pray that you will help us, the Lord, as we just begin with some in introductory material on the Lord, just learning how to really walk in the Spirit and be influenced of you. And Father, I pray that you will help me uh, cleanse me of sin, empty of myself, and fill me with your spirit, the Lord, that I'll be able to preach what thus saith the Lord. And God, I just pray that we'll be able to draw truth from this uh, scripture here, and we'll be able to apply it in our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. So Paul is writing here to the Galatians, and he is kind of identifying this theme throughout Galatians, or really touching on the topic throughout Galatians, the fact that there's kind of a battle, or there's kind of a, a, a war going on between the flesh and the spirit. Now in Galatians chapter 5, uh, we see that there's 15 verses previous to the si or verse 16 where we started reading. So the first phrase in verse 16, the Bible says, this I say then. So what Paul really is saying, this I say then, it's like, okay, everything that I've stated here in the past is leading up to this particular point of the chapter or of the letter that Paul is writing. So this I say then, so in order for us to truly understand or get a grasp or get an idea of what Paul is really talking about here in Galatians uh, 5.16, we should probably get a quick review or maybe a little bit of an introductory material on what Galatians 5 is talking about and we'll see a lot of that in verse number one. The Bible tells us to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So, one of the topics, or the main topic, or the real theme of Galatians 5 is the fact that you and I no longer live in bondage, but rather we live in the liberty of God. And the fact of the matter is, Christian, is you and I have to get in our minds and get it in our, in our lifestyles and our habits. The fact of the matter is we live in liberty and you are obliged to live in, in liberty. You are obligated to live in liberty and not in, in bondage, not in entanglement. The fact of the matter is Jesus Christ died for us so that way we can be free from the law. We can be free from sin and because we are free we ought to live like we're free we do not have the idea of bondage with us anymore we are not bonds uh, or, or excuse me held bondage to our sinner we're not held bondage to the law even but yet we live free and we live more so free because Jesus Christ took that penalty and paid that penalty for us we see um, this throughout from verse number one 
all the way down to verse number six, we see a couple, and for time's sake, I won't read the, the whole thing, but we see that this is kind of the idea, this is kind of the theme that we're seeing in the first six uh, verses. Verse seven is kind of keeping the same idea, but it's kind of shifting gears a little bit and saying that ye did run well, who did hinder you, excuse me, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? And from verse seven on to verse 12, we're seeing the idea that because you and I are living in bond, or excuse me, not in bondage, you and I are living in liberty and not in bondage, we now live as if we're running a race. And we've seen this uh, addressed in the, Bible, in the Bible before, and the fact of the matter is, you and I have to continue to run our race or run our course. Then we get into verse number 13. We're coming back to liberty again. For brethren, ye be called unto liberty, or you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for the occasion to the flesh. Now, in studying this part of scripture, studying this sense of scripture, what we're really seeing here, the Bible tells us because that you and I are living in liberty, it doesn't necessarily mean it gives us the liberty to live to our flesh or live to ourselves. And you're going to see that backed up in just a few verses, basically where we started our main text. You and I live in liberty. You and I live free from the bondage of sin and from the bondage of our own flesh. And we shouldn't really have that desire or shouldn't have that drive to go back to that. We should continue to live in victory of that. And we should continue to live like Jesus Christ had died for us and Jesus Christ has set us free from that. And so uh, Paul here in verse number 13 is simply just reminding us of that. And it's kind of continuing on the, the theme of, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter number five. And then we come to verse 14, the Bible says, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, is it safe to say that if you're living in your flesh, or you're living for your flesh, you're living for yourself? Pretty safe. Um, if I wanted to take care of my flesh, if I wanted to feed my flesh, I'm going to do the things that are going to help nurture my flesh. In other words, I'm going to do pretty selfish things. Uh, I'm going to focus more on me. And by the way, the unfortunate part is that that's the kind of world that we live in today. The world really preaches me, 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 I, 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 take care of me. You got to do things. You got to do right things for yourself. Take advice from somebody one day and just say, what should I do? One of the more common answers you're going to hear is, well, you got to do what's right for you. You got to do the best thing for you. What's going to make you better in this situation? I talk to people at work all the time. Now, granted, they're salespeople and their main drive is money. But by talking to them all the time, they're saying, well, I don't think that if I did that, it would benefit me to get that sale. And there's a lot of I and there's a lot of selfishness in our society today. And it doesn't even just start as you get adults. It's actually taught in, kid, or in, in, in kindergarten and it's taught with children and people in young, or little kids in young ages that it's really about me. Have this self-esteem about yourself. It's all about I. I can do what I want to do, and there is no one who will tell me otherwise. I am my own boss. My interpretation is just as good as your interpretation. I'm just as right as you are. Until you tell me I'm wrong, then I'm more right than you are. That's the kind of idea, that's the kind of teaching that our kids are being taught. It's being taught in our school system to just bring this self-esteem about oneself. And what Paul is saying here is we ought to love each other and live for each other and serve each other. Love one another, excuse me, love thy neighbor as thyself. And we see in verse number 15, the Bible says, but if ye, or excuse me, if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. If you and I are going to be continually against each other, biting one another, devouring, well, yeah, devouring one another, or going against each other, we're going to see ourselves really just come down and really just be brought down. It's not what we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to live for each other. We're supposed to live for the Lord, and we're supposed to think of others and not ourselves live to our flesh. So, with all that being said, or in Paul's words, this I say then, and we get to the beginning of our scripture here. Walk in the Spirit. I want to take draw a few points here 
And like I said, it's going to be a rather, probably the shortest message of the series. Probably have another 10 minutes with you and then we'll call it a night. But I want to look at a few verses and draw a couple truths and really set up for the next two messages that will come after that. The Bible says in verse 16, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, walking in the Spirit is not necessarily a new concept. For many of us who are saved, or many of us who have been saved before, we can think of countless scriptures where this is being preached. In fact, it's stated again, even in this uh, chapter already. Verse number 25, the Bible says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Uh, I have a couple more here. I think of James chapter 1. If we walk in the light as he in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and truly our fellowship with the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, I see um, Ephesians 2.10 for we are his workmanship and created in Jesus Christ into good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, 1 John 4.1 uh, Beloved, believe not, or excuse me, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone um, out into the world and there are more references and there are more verses just talking about the idea of walking in the spirit or walking in the light or trying the spirits to making sure, making sure that it's actually the spirit of God that we're walking with. Now the idea of walking in the spirit, or the word walk, gives the implications of a guidance, or an influence. So the Bible tells us essentially to walk or be guided in the spirit, or to be led by the spirit. We thought the idea that you and I are in liberty and we're no longer in bondage we are to be guided by the very thing that set us free, more specifically the Holy Spirit. We are to live in that liberty through the Holy Spirit. And the fact of the matter is, influences and guidances always affect our decision. When you hear the phrase under the influence, one of the first things you always connote with is alcohol. Why do we say that phrase and all that person is under the influence of alcohol? Is it because they probably saw a bottle? No, you can probably uh, determine the fact that someone's under the influence without seeing a bottle. There are some ways that you can see that a person is under the influence of alcohol. You can tell it by driving, can't you? Uh, I think a lot of, <laughs> I think there's a lot of drivers, unfortunately, sometimes that drive under the influence, but they uh, have awful judgment. They don't turn necessarily as sharply as they should or they're always running red lights or maybe their speed limit is nowhere near or their speed is nowhere near the speed limit there are things that go on in their life because of this influence of alcohol that causes them to make particular decisions mostly bad ones mostly ones that end up taking the life of somebody else or end up putting themselves in particular dangers because they're under the influence of alcohol. This is under an influence that's not their own. It's an influence where assuming that they are a good Samaritan or a person who's a law-abiding citizen, because they're making these bad choices or because they're breaking the law, it's simply because they're under the wrong influence. They're not under their own power. They're under the power of alcohol. So because they're under the power of alcohol, because they're under the power or under the influence of alcohol, they, like I said, have awful judgment with their driving. Uh, maybe their words are slurred. It goes further than driving. Uh, I know of people, I know of families whose houses are absolutely abused because the father or the mother or someone in their house is just constantly under the influence of alcohol. Now, under good nature and in themselves, you would like to think that nobody's just going to randomly beat their families, but how many of us know of situations or people who are just in an alcoholic home and it just destroys the house? I've never heard of a situation where a person's in an alcoholic home and the home is the best home there is. I've never heard of a situation where uh, people who are under the influence of alcohol always make great, smart decisions because it's a negative influence and you and I as I stated earlier in the message are always influenced or are always guided by something so the fact of the matter is when the Bible tells us to walk in the spirit we ought to be guided by the spirit now one is one of the things that happens when we're guided by the spirit well it's told in the rest of the verse right there verse 16 walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill 
the lusts of the, of the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, the result is resisting the lusts of the flesh. Now, what is the lust of the flesh? I heard a lot of preachers say it's sin. Oh, the sin in your life. The lust of the flesh is just all sin. Now, granted, I think the lust of a fle the flesh can produce sin. I think sin is the production of the lust of the flesh. But the idea of lust of the flesh is the desire of your own flesh or feeding your flesh or the desire of yourself, per se. Whatever your flesh would want. Now let's go ahead and destroy with this notion. What, what is it? Dispense, Dispense of the notion. Thing. Destroy. That's the word I use. Sorry. Dispense of the notion <laughs> that you can live in a middle ground. There's a lot of Christians that say, you know what, I am going to just live my life and take care of myself and do what I want. And God won't judge me. God will still love me. God's going to love me for who I am. Anybody ever talk to somebody like that? I most certainly have. You have no right to judge me because God's going to love me. Well, that's true. God does love you, but he's, he's the one that's going to judge you, not me. And the fact of the matter is, when you and I decide to feed our flesh on the opposite side, we're doing what the Bible tells us not to do, and that's quenching the spirit. There's no middle ground. You will not make both realms happy. You're not going to live this great life. In fact, if you try to live that middle ground that doesn't exist, all you're going to do is end up miserable because you won't have the true joy knowing that you're living 100% in the Spirit, walking 100% in the Spirit, and walking with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Rather, you're going to be trying to serve Him, and you're going to be trying to, to appease to Him and, and appease to your Savior, knowing that it's not working, and then you're going to be trying to appease to yourself and take care of your own flesh, knowing that that's not working. And all you're going to do is end up in one big miserable mess. And there's no such thing, Christian, as the middle ground. Uh, there's no such thing as just being a, a, a Christian so that way you can just get out of hell and make sure when you die you get to heaven. No, when you're saved, when, the Jesus, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and you accepted that gift, you are obligated once again to live in liberty. And to live in liberty, you have to walk in the Spirit. And there's no middle ground to that. There is no, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to feed my flesh a little bit here. I'm going to try to uh, go to church and, and, and probably soul win on Monday and go to prayer, uh, men's prayer, and then I'm going to go to the club tonight. It doesn't, it doesn't <clears throat> work. Verse 17 clearly depicts, the, uh, the Bible says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These two aren't working hand to hand. They're going against each other. The Bible tells us in the remaining, or remaining of that uh, verse, and these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. The lust of your flesh is going to try to get you to do the things that the Spirit would not want you to do. Walking in the Spirit is going to allow you to do the things that the flesh would not want you to do. And there's no middle ground. There's no agreement. There's no treaty that says, you know what, yeah, flesh, I agree, spirit, I agree, you can do this. They're polar opposites. And Christian, you and I have to recognize that we're only going to be under the influence of one of these two. We can't be under the influence of both. It's just not possible. Uh, they're both going against each other. They're go both fighting against each other. And if you feed one, then you're under the influence of that. If you flee, feed the flesh, you're under the influence of your flesh. If you do the things of the flesh, you're under the influence of the flesh. But if you do the things of the Spirit, you're under the influence of the Spirit. And Christian, might I just urge you to truly check your life and truly understand what does it mean and what are some of the results and what are some of the benefits of just walking in the spirit giving a hundred percent to God and saying God my life is yours I want nothing to do with it I want you to take a hundred percent control and wherever it goes wherever it leads as long as you're in control I'll have joy and be content because no knowing that you are in control is my joy I've never 
you don't hear the prayer, God, I want you to take control in my life, make sure I'm the best businessman that I can be and have a lot of money. And if you do hear that prayer, it's not a very good one because you're trying to appease both your flesh and both the spirit. And the fact of the matter is, God's will for your life is exactly what you need to be focused on. And walking in the spirit is exactly what you need to be focused on. Verse 18, the Bible says, but if you're led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Again, if you live under the spirit because you live in liberty, you'll experience that liberty. Now, what are some results of living in the flesh? What are some results of being influenced of the flesh? What are some results of being influenced by the spirit? And how can we take all of that, all of that which is said in Galatians 5, and apply it to our life even today? We'll continue more so looking on how we can live in the Spirit by avoiding to live in the flesh next week. Father, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, I had to speak um, the Lord from your word. And I just pray that you and I, or that you would be able to uh, help us through God uh, to live under the influence of the Spirit, the Lord, walk in the Spirit, the Lord, and walk in the light, rather than walk for ourselves and walk in the flesh, the Lord. And we love you and praise you for all that you do. We ask this in your name. Amen.